Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Your Royal Highness, good afternoon and welcome. Um, I want to start by saying a massive thank you to my sponsor, McDonald's UK and Ireland, and also the Nuffield Scholarship Trust. In 2003, no, 2023, sorry, then MP George Eustace told delegates at the NFU conference that they should turn to their organic manures as an alternative to the artificial fertilizers that had just increased 300% in value. At the same time, or roughly the same time, the UK government had just given notice on the impending enforcement of the farming rules for water. Once again, the UK government contradicting itself. With George Eustace's advice ringing in my ears, I set off on my Nuffield travel, and the first question I had was, can organic manures replace artificial fertilizers? This farmer in Qatar, when I asked him that very question, chuckled, and explained to me that he could apply all of the organic, no, all of the artificial fertilizers available to him, and he would not be able to grow a single thing until he had first applied organic manures. For him, the water holding capacity of his soils was the limiting factor, and artificial fertilizers did not address this. In fact, they compounded this issue and arguably made it worse. Organic manures, on the other hand, did. The question should not be, can organic manures replace artificial fertilizers? It should arguably be, can artificial fertilizers replace organic manures? I think we can all agree the questions are resounding, no. The next question I wanted to ask was, to what extent do organic manures improve soil health and fertility? This image was taken in Iceland, and it shows some severely degraded soils. Two individuals, Julia and Bjork, had set themselves a challenge of trying to regenerate the degraded Icelandic soils. They were taking household food waste, they were processing it, and then they were using that as an organic fertilizer to try and regenerate the soils. Let's see how they got on. This little green oasis, as they call it, oh, <laughs> smooth. Um, this little green oasis, was where they applied organic manures. The grey, lifeless surround is where they hadn't. The difference between life and death in this instance was stark. The value of organic manures, I think, fairly evident. The next question I wanted to address was what role can organic manures play in reaching net zero? This is arguably a topic all of its own, and the answers that I'm about to provide are a little bit fluffy and you'll understand why as I go through them. I thought I'd actually cracked it when I visited Rothamsted Research and their long-term winter wheat experiments dating back to 1843. They showed that regular applications of organic manure consistently increased soil organic carbon. If we have more carbon in the soil, we have less in the atmosphere, and in my mind, that was carbon sequestration. Having spoken to experts who know a little bit more than me when it comes to all things carbon, including Becky Wilson, Nuffield Scholar, but also scientists at Reading University and Qatar University, they explained that wasn't quite the case. Using organic manures was more like carbon shuffling as opposed to carbon sequestration, and I needed to consider the full life cycle analysis before I made any conclusions on whether or not carbon had been sequestered. If we grow biomass over here, we harvest it, we transport it, we process it, we transport it, and then apply it over here, the carbon required to get it from A to B is far greater than the carbon we actually put back into the soils. So the, the, the carbon cycle, or the full life cycle analysis, becomes extremely important. The exception is when you don't have to transport and you're producing organic manures on your own farm. If you're producing these organic manures, you haven't got to transport them. You might even have to move them already. So the process becomes very important to the potential carbon benefits or negatives, depending on which process you adopt. The black shapes you can see behind are visual representations of the total carbon in the feedstock before it's processed. The white shapes you now see are the total carbon left after that process has been complete. Thermophilic composting, for example, 
loses up to 75% of the total carbon, whereas Bokashi fermentation, on the other hand, loses between 1% and 3%, depending on the paper that you read. Significant difference. Now, this carbon doesn't necessarily contribute to our net farm emissions because the carbon within organic matter is being cycled. It's cyclical. However, if you're looking at feeding soil biology, as the Ingham has described and explained, the soil food web as an ecosystem, then carbon becomes really important, and the value is all to you, the farmer, the manager of that soil. The ecosystem within the soil is fully dependent on the amount of energy entering it. So if you want to grow that ecosystem, you need to feed it more energy. Energy, in this instance, is carbon. We need to feed it. So the more carbon that we can retain through our processing and the more carbon we can put back into the soil, the greater that ecosystem becomes. And we all know that the soil is a foundation upon which every farming enterprise is built. The final question I wanted to look at was the comparison of different types of decomposition. So having done a bit of research before I set off on my travels, which I found quite useful, was that the four main types of decomposition include thermophilic, mesophilic, anaerobic fermentation, and anaerobic digestion. This flowchart, which I'm not going to ask questions on, so don't feel like you've got to try and read it all, um, and don't ask me any questions on this either at the end of it, um, explains quite nicely and simply how the different processes work and the microbial pathways involved in each process. It was discovered, or not discovered, but created by Professor Higa, who I visited in Okinawa in Japan. The bottom line is this. Almost all applications of organic manure have a positive effect on the soil. That's the bottom line. So which method you choose doesn't really matter because they're all going to have a benefit. But I wanted to understand if there was a difference, if one provided something that the others didn't. So I set off on my travels. This was me standing on a windrow in Chile, looking at some thermophilically composted organic matter. Thermophilic, hot, um, turned regularly, oxidative, um, very popular in the UK. A lot of green waste is processed this way, and a number of farmers are, or an increasing number of farmers, are buying compost turners to process their own organic manures. The alternative to that, but still thermophilic, is aerated static pile composting, like this one in Japan where instead of turning, they're injecting oxygen through pipes into the heaps. This reduces the amount of fossil fuels required for the turning, but still creates the same quality end product. We also saw, verm saw vermicomposting in Kenya. This is something I'm particularly interested in. Um, Mother Nature doesn't do anything by accident, and Mother Nature's decomposers are earthworms. So it frustrates me that the UK regulation restricts the use of recycling organic matters through the use of worms, because the value is very clear. This farmer in particular saw the benefits of it. This was Murray, who was making bakashi in the South Island of New Zealand. Bakashi is something that I'm personally interested in and do a lot of in the UK, um, but I wanted to see how others were doing it internationally. So Murray was actually sourcing waste organic material from his neighbours bringing them to his own farm and using them to then fertilize his own land. This is also something that's very popular in the Netherlands, with a number of councils adopting this over thermophilic composting due to its environmental credentials and scalability. Finally, I had a look at anaerobic digestion. Now, this is probably the exception to the rule of all organic manures are beneficial for the soil, as there are some negative effects. However, the anaerobic digestion in this system and the methane production was being used in the farmstead. The methane was being used as a source for cooking, heating, and also energy generation. The end product, the digestate, was then being used to feed crops for animal and human consumption. It was probably the best example of a circular economy that I saw, um, and something that we should all learn from is uh, the Kenyans are far more resourceful than what we are. When it came to summarizing all of this, having traveled to every continent with the exception of Antarctica, I don't think there's much organic waste produced in Antarctica, um, it was actually Anne Bogle, ADAS, that summarized it better than anyone. And she explained to delegates at this conference that both quality and quantity matter 
and that not all organic manures are created equal. I tried to, as a very visual person, I tried to summarise that as best I could with the visual representation and all of the organic manure amendments that are applied, and you can see here, uh, have been sorted based on the type of carbon that they provide. So you've got biochar, for example, on one extreme, and you've got molasses on the other. Biochar provides a very stable, almost inert carbon to the soil, which doesn't provide much energy to living organisms and the, micro, the, the ecosystem within the soil. However, it does persist within that soil for hundreds, if not thousands of years. On the other hand, we have molasses, provides loads of energy in a really short burst, but doesn't last very long. Which is best for you depends on what you're trying to achieve, and also depends on your context. It might be that you have to change different processes at different times to suit different needs. Moving forward, I always compare the soil to the fridge at home. If we continue to take food from the fridge, we're eventually going to go hungry. If we continue to mine the natural fertility of our soils that have been built up over millennia, we will eventually go hungry. I think Alistair explained it really well earlier on. Um, we take for granted our soils and we take for granted the organic matter within them because that natural fertility has been built up millennia ago. We cannot keep exploiting it indefinitely. We have to start returning something. So if I'm going to ask you to do something at the end of my, my topic and the end of my study, it's probably this, both literally and metaphorically. <laughs> I thought that might get a few chuckles. Um, I want to take and compare to food waste. We do not value food enough to not waste it. 20% of food in the UK, sold in the UK, is wasted. If the value of that food was higher, would we all value it a little bit more? Everybody drinks the last drop of whiskey in an expensive whiskey bottle, but when it comes to a bottle of water, I've seen plenty left around today with a little bit left in the bottom. We're very wasteful. The same principle applies for organic manures. If we were to increase the value of fertilizers, possibly even a fertilizer tax, would we then value our organic manures more? The parting bit that I'm going to leave you with is my request and the one thing that I'm going to ask you to do. If you produce organic manures on your farm, please, please, please analyze them. Forget RB209, analyze them, sit down with your agronomist or an advisor and put a value on them. I think you'll be surprised at how much value and how much resource you have in your sheds that historically you have considered a waste product. I want to thank my sponsors again, McDonald's UK and Ireland. And I also want to, th I also want to thank Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust for the amazing opportunity and the trust they placed in me. Thank you.